Tom Lee coming back. I have shared with you all a little bit about Steve, but uh, as we all know, direct experience is the best way to gather data and to experience and to connect. So thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, it's good to be here. So it's funny, I was telling Scott that sometimes I don't come back here for a couple of years, and I've been here twice this week. Um, I've got really fond memories of the University of Miami School of Law. I graduated here mm, 21 years ago, which is hard to believe. Uh, I met my wife here. Her name is Cheryl. She now makes me call her Professor Zuckerman. <laughs> Some of you guys might know her. And uh, I really applaud Scott for teaching this class. And I hope you all know how lucky you are to take it because it's such an incredibly um, important part of our development and before Scott brought this program here, there was nothing like it when I was here, and I wish there was. So I was talking to Scott last week, thinking about what I might talk about today, and he told me that John Kabat-Zinn dropped in last week via Skype, and I'm like, and he's like a Michael Jordan of mindfulness. <laughs> I don't want to follow him. And I'm really, I've, I've meditated every day for a long time, for a number of years, but in the realm of the science and the technicalities, I'm, I'm a neophyte compared to Scott or to certainly John Kabat-Zinn or Sharon Salzberg or other people you might have studied here. So, so what can I talk to you about that would really add value to you? And it hit me that I've learned a lot of my journey over the last 20 years, um, made a lot of mistakes, a lot of suffering, and I thought it would be really interesting to talk about the things I've learned, which I wish I knew when I was in your shoes. I wish somebody would have taught me then. Um, and what I'm talking about is not about how to be a great lawyer, not about how to be successful, not how to get really rich, none of those things. Because at the end of the day, while those were my objectives when I was sitting in your shoes, candidly, what I figured out is that's really just the transportation to get to a much bigger objective, a bigger goal, and that's happiness. Right? And, and when I talk about happiness, I talk about um, an inner joy, a childlike enthusiasm for life, a unshakable sense of serenity, peace, and equanimity. And that's my definition of happiness now. And I've learned a lot about um, what creates happiness and what doesn't. And it really starts with this kind of egg-shaped thing on our shoulders, this supercomputer that processes information and, and reacts to stimuli. And the um, quality and the manner in which it does really determines the quality of our life. So I'm often amazed at the power of our human mind. We could do some amazing things. We could send people to outer space. We can split atoms. We could create these devices. I could write something on it. You can see it on your phone. I don't know how any of that works. The problem is we have a lot of thoughts during the day. I've heard some people say more than 50,000 thoughts. And the vast majority of them are negative-based thoughts. And when we're not solving problems, we're often creating problems. And so, we have this machine in our head that's constantly turning, and when it's focused, like a laser beam, it can accomplish great things. But when it's unfocused, which is a lot of times during the day, it's just creating issues for ourselves. <clears throat> and so um, I've spent a lot of time learning about it, the nature of the mind and what goes on. And for me, and I think probably a lot of you and most people, there's the same thing <coughs> over and over and over again. It's, it's thinking about the past, and things that happened to us, whether five minutes ago or five years ago, fueling resentments and sadness and anger. We worry about the future, which could be 10 minutes from now or 10 years from now, which causes um, anxiety. I think Dan Harris, in his book, I don't know if you all read that book, but has this great line, maybe, maybe I heard him say this, with one leg in the past and one leg in the future, you're peeing on the present. <laughs> right, so, so we go through our lives living in the past, living in the future, and these thought patterns create emotions, really strong emotions. And ultimately, we get to the point, often self-consciously, of creating coping strategies to deal with these emotions. And we all have our own strategies. We become experts in things we do to make us feel better. Some of it's working really hard, some of it's relationships, Facebook, prescription pills, alcohol, drugs, gambling, whatever it is. And oftentimes, we're good at deluding ourselves that those are productive behaviors. But what winds up happening is we create more problems for ourselves as we go on because we don't deal with the real issues. And what I've found is that my mind, I like to envision it as like a garden. And my thoughts are the seeds. And every day and every moment, I can either plant seeds that are going to turn into flowers and bloom into a beautiful garden, or I can plant a bunch of weeds. And it depends really on what I focus on. 
It starts with my thoughts and my words and my emotions and my behaviors. So I become really careful, really aware of what goes on up there. I always view kind of like this guard, this sentry standing <coughs> guard at, at, at my mind being prudent about the thoughts that emerge from it and the words that come out of my mouth. And I'm certainly not perfect, but I'm a lot more mindful of how that goes on. And, and what I found also is that we become really good storytellers. And I think this has evolved over tens of thousands of years. And we all tell ourselves stories and have these narratives. And our stories often create a lot of <coughs> challenges for us. And they become our themes that we repeat throughout our lives. And they're often <coughs> negative based and things that happen to us and slights. And we accumulate these things as, as we go through life. And ultimately, they build up. And there's a point in time when, when we have to face them or not and just keep continue deluding ourselves. And, um, the trajectory of my life really changed when I unwound my story and unpacked it and figured out what was driving some of my discontent. And I'll share a little bit about my journey. I'll tell you that it's important to give you a disclaimer. Like sometimes you see in a movie, it says based on a true story. Like what I'm about to tell you is based on a true story, which is really not meant to be funny. It's, it's kind of funny and kind of serious in that our minds don't remember things correctly from 10 minutes ago, certainly not 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So we have faulty memories and we've got an ego that conspires because it has its own agenda to shape those memories. So in any event, what I'm about to tell you, I think is the truth, but who knows. <laughs> so I grew up in a um, rough neighborhood in Queens, New York, a place called Far Rockaway. Anybody from New York? No New Yorkers? What's happening here? <laughs> so Far Rockaway is a tough neighborhood, a lot of housing projects. I grew up in a subsidized um, housing complex, small apartment. Um, my father was murdered when I was three months old, which, as you can imagine, um, was a very tough thing for my family. I had an older brother that was two years older than I was. I had a stepfather that came into my life when I was about five or six years old, who was a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type, one minute very loving and doting and caring and generous. The next could be in a blind range about something really small and stupid. So there was a lot of chaos in my apartment. I survived by playing basketball. I was a good athlete. Uh, my brother, who is about two years older than I, we shared bunk beds, and he and I fought every single day, like violently fought every day. And I think it was probably a reflection of our surroundings, a lot of noise in our apartment, a lot of danger and violence in our neighborhood. So we would punch, choke, we even stab each other a few times, which I have the most, my kids have the most idyllic life. I have two beautiful daughters, I live in a nice neighborhood in Miami Beach. I tell them these stories, they're like, yeah, whatever. Then I show them scars. Like, Stab your brother? <laughs> so it was, it was, you know, it was a long time ago, but it was a different mindset. My brother really never assimilated. He was a smart kid, got into trouble. He wound up overdosing and dying when he was in his early twenties. So, you know, another tragedy for the family. And uh, my mother was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer about nine years ago. She was my best friend, my source of inspiration. We spoke every day because she had gone through so much. She had gone through her husband dying, my father, her oldest son dying, my stepfather, who you never know what mood you were going to catch him in. And so it was really traumatic. And, and I don't know, if, hopefully none of you guys have been there yet, but there, there's this weird paradigm where the child becomes a parent. And that's not fun. Right? So hopefully you don't get there anytime soon. But my, my mom was living up in Boca taking her to doctors, treatment centers, surgeries, hospice, and, and you know, that ended. So during that process, I was in a, this kind of, I call it sank into the sea of sadness and despair, just really in a bad spot, and it's about nine years ago. And then I had this um, recognition that all the things I thought would make me really happy in life, the achievement. So I went out to, be, I started my first business when I was 18 or 19, I was promoting nightclub parties, which was really fun and really lucrative. Came to law school, didn't really want to be a lawyer, wanted the education. Um, wound up doing a tech company that didn't work out and practicing law, but succeeded as a lawyer, then started a division of an investment bank, succeeded as an investment banker, then started a software company, succeeded as, you know. It, and where I come from, that doesn't happen. That's not the trajectory. So I had built this fantasy in my mind. If I get X, if I achieve Y, if I do Z, I will be an internal state of bliss. And, and at that time, when I was grieving my mother, the recognition hit me that that's totally untrue. I've been listening to this voice for 20 years, and I couldn't be more miserable. So that was a that was a deeper state of despair of like, 
I was kind of tilting at windmills. I was chasing these things that I thought were going to make me happy and, and didn't. And ultimately, um, I had to get underneath that story. I had to understand that I had a lot of things going on that I didn't know how to deal with. I had a lot of self-pity for losing family members. I had a lot of resentments towards stepfather and others. I grew up in a neighborhood where there was a lot of violence. I went to a high school that was even in a worse neighborhood, taking the subway. None of you from New York, but in the 80s, getting on the A train was to put your life in, in your hands and a lot of issues there. So I developed these great street smarts and a lot of emotional intelligence. And, and you know, look at me, I don't look like the toughest guy in, in the room, right? Like, you put me in a neighborhood where people are killers, like the toughest guys in East New York, Brownsville, where Mike Tyson, and you might have seen pictures of the red um, kind of brownstone buildings that are called housing projects in the Northeast. I'm the first guy getting picked on. Right? So I survived in my neighborhood because I'm pretty good at talking shit and pretty good at playing basketball. Once I got out of my neighborhood, it was a totally different story. So I had these great emotional intelligence skills and street smarts. I always knew when something was going down, but living in that constant state of fight or flight definitely took its toll. And I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how to deal with kind of the different emotions. I never named them. I had no mindfulness. I had no meditation practice. I had no awareness. I went to college in Boston to BU, and right away I met a bunch of rich kids. And I didn't know rich kids. So their, their life was totally different and interesting to me, and I was envious of them and jealous of them, but I wanted to be like them or their families. But then I would go come home um, to the, it's called the rock, right? I grew up to the rock in the summertime, and I had like one foot in, in each world. And, and I remember, I think it was my sophomore year, I was home and I saw a good friend of mine, my best childhood friend, his, his nickname was Poppy, on the boardwalk, we grew up near the ocean, <clears throat> and Poppy, like a lot of guys I grew up with, had a lot of potential, but victim of circumstance. So Poppy was stabbed multiple times in an altercation not far from our apartment and created the mindset of, you can't beat him, join him. Poppy became a very successful drug dealer because he was very smart and he would have been a CEO. In fact, he was a CEO, but just of a illegal enterprise. <laughs> right, so I came home and I saw him on the boardwalk and every time I saw him, I would always try to talk to him about changing his life and staying out of trouble and, and he had about 25 of his friends around him and one of the friends came up to him and said, hey Pop, you know, see those guys down there? Those are the guys from Brooklyn. From the, you know, if you've seen the movies, that's how it really is. Right? There's always drama because of something that happened two months ago or whatever. So I convinced Poppy to not get involved in this fight and let his friends go beat up these other guys that they have in numbers. So a fight breaks out literally where that tree is, 30, 40 yards away. Poppy and I are talking like nothing's going on which is sort of a weird culture class because I'm now at BU with a bunch of rich kids and live in big mansions in Montclair, New Jersey, and I'm watching Poppy and his friends beat up somebody about 50 yards away from me. Next thing you know, you hear pop, 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 pop. He grabs me, throws me to the ground. One of the guys in the fight had a gun, started shooting, and Poppy's friend that started it came running back at us and holding his face, and he had a gunshot in his mouth. He got shot through his cheek with a pole like this. And that, that was just like, one story, but I was, I experienced a bunch of that. That was probably one of the most severe ones. But I was like, okay, this world is not for me anymore. And I'm not sure if the world of in, in Boston is for me either, but um, I just then created a path of, I'm going to do the things that I think are gonna make me happy, which was success, achievement, get as much money as possible, partying, relationships, basically all ways to, um, occupy that thought monster that I like to call it without paying any attention to what it was really saying or what was going on. And so I did that for a long time until my mom died and then I was just very depressed. Fortunately about that time I discovered meditation and I dove deep into the um, Eastern philosophy from which meditation emerges. <coughs> and I learned some really interesting things like I'm not the voice in my head. And that might seem like pretty basic stuff to people that study this for a long time. But I always acted that I'm sad or I'm disappointed or I'm frustrated or I'm resentful or I'm full of self-pity as opposed to I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling resentful, which is a big difference. It's, it's the difference of being in the play versus getting off the stage, walking outside and watching the play, right? Right? watching the thoughts, watching the emotions. And I learned that my mind's job 
is not to make me happy. And that was a really big one for me. It's like, my mind's job programmed for 50,000 years of evolution is to make sure I survive today and tomorrow. And that means doing whatever is necessary, and it often means doing things that conflict with happiness, serenity, equanimity, peace, enthusiasm for life. And I realize it's my responsibility to be happy, not my mind's job. If I leave it to my mind, I will worry about it, these small things that my mind doesn't know are real threats, but will treat it like a real threat. And my mind will ruminate on all the stuff that happened 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago, because it likes to solve problems and be preoccupied with resentments and anger. So that stuff was huge for me. Right? And um, it really changed the trajectory of my life. It helped me reframe my childhood. It helped me reframe a lot of the things I experienced. <coughs> it helped me realize that I needed a blueprint, an operating manual to live, because I was just sort of stumbling around chasing things that I thought would make me happy in the moment. So I wound up creating um, this program that I call SMASH. I was in a meditation retreat in upstate New York, a place called the Mega. Have you been to a Mega? Yeah, it's an amazing place. And coming home, which is really funny, I was listening to my, my phone, on, and I was listening to music on shuffle, and a Jay-Z song popped up. The title of the album is Blueprint. And I'm like, oh, I need a blueprint. That's what I need. I need a blueprint for living. And so I created this acronym called SMASH. And the idea is that I needed to smash my old way of thinking things. My old, like, poor me, oh, this stuff happened, I'm the victim, I've had all these tragedies, blah, 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 who cares? Smash this um, old notion of success It's going to bring me happiness. And each one of the letters stands for a different things. So I'll touch upon each one of those because I think they're really helpful. And, and it's the operating program by which I live my life every single day. So S stands for spirituality. I'll tell you I'm not a spiritual guru, and I barely understand it myself. And that's not false modesty. I, I swear to you, I, I really don't understand it that well, despite reading a couple hundred books on it. <clears throat> the only thing that, that makes sense to me is developing spiritual principles. For me, they're kindness, love, compassion, gratitude, honesty, and humility. And all I know is once I started revolving my life around those principles, my life started to change. So somebody said, I don't know if it was Dalai Lama or somebody really smarter than me, said, we don't change the way we see life changes. Right? So when I started changing my lens through which I perceive reality, everything around me started getting better. So I view spirituality as spiritual principles, um, kind of a thread of benevolent energy that's woven into us, to each of our souls, that inspires us to be kind, inspires us to be connect, compassionate, and to connect us. And I also believe that my life, and everybody's life who enters my orbit, is better if I work by spiritual principles. Because my instincts and my impulses can be very counterproductive to my own real happiness and other people's. And I don't beat myself up for those thoughts and impulses and desires anymore because I don't know where they come from. They were programmed thousands of years ago. All I know is I don't have to necessarily listen to them anymore. I could, I could watch them. That doesn't mean I become complacent. So I'm an entrepreneur. I've had an interesting professional trajectory through several different careers. And I could be as tough and as fierce as really anybody because I'm very determined, I'm very persistent. The difference today is I do it with self-awareness. Um, I think I'm a lot fairer, a lot more kind, a lot more compassionate. But I don't live some monastic life and I'm not going to Tibet anytime soon to live in a cave. That might sound interesting in 20, 30 years, but my point is you can be spiritual and be successful in the Western kind of connotation or definition of success. M is for meditation. Probably something we talk a lot about here. Meditation has changed my life. I do it every day. I was driving last week and it struck me as I was pulling up to a traffic light that the yellow in the traffic light is meditation. <coughs> Because without that yellow, if there's just green and red, there's going to be a lot more collisions. There's no space. So for me, meditation is the space between thoughts, emotions, behaviors. It's that yellow light. It's pause. Yes, I could be reactionary like all of us. And I have thoughts and desires and impulses. But I get a chance to choose <coughs> my spiritual principles versus my ego gratifying behaviors that are programmed into me that still exist. And it also enables me to become friends with this thing in here. This 
what I call the thought, thought monster or bad roommate or there, there's a lot of different good names for it. I get to see it in operation. And when I'm on my game, I actually am amused by how irrational my thoughts are, how crazy they could be. Um, we all have patterns, and I've gotten to understand some of my patterns, like I'm hypersensitive to being wrong or disrespected because of my childhood, where I come from, the way I grew up, my environment, my, my brother, my stepfather outside. You've got to be really careful about that. And so if I get an email that I perceive to be um, threatening in any way, shape, or form, I go to DEF CON 1. I'll pull off to 95, get on the side, and I want to engage. And unfortunately, I'm not exaggerating. Now, I haven't done that in a number of years because I've gotten better at creating some space. <laughs> but I will engage very quickly, and the story I tell myself when, I, I always criticize people that go to Ivy League schools because probably I'm jealous of them, but some guy who goes to Harvard and got his MBA, and he's you know, trying to be tough, and Eric, I'm like, you don't know where I came from. I'm not, I'm not impacted by that, right? Like, where are you? I will drive over there. <laughs> not helpful. Kind of thoughts? I've gotten a lot of distance from that, and I rarely, if ever, do that. I don't remember the last time I did that. Really want to engage with somebody at that level. So meditation has helped unlock that peace and serenity, the wisdom that lies beneath the surface of the mind that doesn't stop talking. I've got this insatiable child in my head that's always whispering to me, if just X, if only Y, if you get Z, if you get that D. Like, I have a better understanding of that little child in my head now, and I don't listen to it. Meditation is so important for that. A is autonomy. So I know that's something we talk about here as well. <clears throat> Early in my career, I practiced law at a great law firm called Berger Singerman. Do I hear the firm? No. Fantastic firm. Worked directly with one of the founding partners named Paul Singerman, who Scott knows very well, and um, best lawyer ever met in my entire life, period. Amazing. He can get up here and speak for an hour better than I can write, and I fancy myself a pretty good writer. <laughs> he is a genius, um, but he's also a perfectionist, and working for him was not easy. And I knew the law thing would be temporary for me, so I wanted to hitch my wagon to the best and brightest, learn as much as possible, and honestly it was painful. Because Paul didn't strive for per perfection, it was a requirement. So turning in something that was an A minus or B plus, that we might have been pretty proud of, was like start over, gotta do that again, not good. And working 70, 80 hours a week was pretty routine, and he was also the kind of guy that was with you. So you, he wasn't on the golf course telling you to work hard. He was working harder than you, which still boggles my mind. It didn't take me too long to realize, I don't want to do this forever. I, I, this, is, this is not fun. And so I, I figured out that becoming a rainmaker is the path for much greater freedom, flexibility, autonomy. And I can talk about that some other time. I actually wrote a book about seven years ago, eight years ago, on how to be, become a rainmaker. Yes, you will make more money, but that's not the point. The point is a lot more freedom, a lot more flexibility. Uh, it actually didn't take hold until I transitioned to investment banking. I built a division in investment banking, and I applied these skills a lot, which I learned from Paul, and really just developed the formula that worked to becoming a rainmaker, and my life got a lot better. And today, as an entrepreneur, I guard my autonomy like the crown jewel. I am very firm about my schedule. I, it's really important to me to have the flexibility and freedom to do several things each day. One is spending time with family and friends and my kids and my wife. I'm rarely not home for dinner. I'm rarely working. So I'll work late at night in my, my house after people go to sleep. But I don't do the dinner thing anymore. I don't travel unless I have to actually travel. It's absolutely necessary. So that, that's really um, important for spending time with family, spending time doing the things that are important to me, which is staying healthy, exercise, and working on passion projects. And I'll talk a little bit about that next. So that's the A, autonomy, super important in my life. S is service, so helping people, being useful. This is the one that's the most counterintuitive. <laughs> It still surprises me because I grew up in a way where it'd be disingenuous to say I was really poor, I wasn't, I had food, I had all the stuff you needed. But I grew up 
getting assistance. And we grew up in subsidized housing. The rent was I don't know, $400 a month, right? It was subsidized by the government. I got needs-based grants for college because we couldn't afford to go to college. So fortunately, I got that. And I didn't grow up with a mindset of, let's go build a house and perhaps have humanity. Like, people were doing that in our neighborhood. And I probably grew up um, economically better than all my friends. All my friends that I grew up with grew up in very tough situations, single parent, abusive families, parents dying, like all that stuff. It was kind of a goodwill hunting, right? We were brothers and we stuck together, we were family, and none of us were building houses on the weekend, we're going to Costa Rica. So I never did anything to give back. That's not a good excuse, it's just sort of what happened. Um, in connection with after my mom dying and figuring out a bunch of stuff, one of the things I changed is my outlook. And it's really important for me now to give more than I take. It's one of my key values. So I, one of the first things I did was create a meditation program in uh, my daughter's elementary school. Scott was actually very influential in helping us do that because, again, while I meditate every day, I don't have the credentials that Scott has and the expertise to go convince a school administration to do that. So we did that. and. It actually grew and went into a bunch of classrooms for a number of years. A big thing that I did was start a nonprofit called Rise Up, and I teach what I call mindful entrepreneurship in prison, and also people that have been released from prison. The idea is helping them transform their hustle. They're entrepreneurs, just like my friend Poppy was an entrepreneur. You're just selling illegal stuff. And the problem is that our correctional system is broken. Three out of four people that get released from jail go back to jail. So if I said to you, how about you buy a car that three or four times doesn't work? Pretty quickly you take that car as a piece of crap, I want my money back. But we spend billions of dollars a year on this correctional system that doesn't work because we don't rehabilitate people, they come out worse than they went in, and it impacts all of us. It's not only expensive, but when they're committing additional crimes, it's not just in Overtown. It's, in, it's wherever you live, if you live in Overtown or wherever community you live. And ultimately it was a path to forgiveness for the person who was a career criminal that murdered my father. And I didn't understand that at the moment, but that's a, there's a big element of that in it. So I teach them the basics of being an entrepreneur. We build a business plan. At the end, it's kind of like a shark tank in jail. They pitch to myself and a few friends that are entrepreneurs. But I also te teach them about um, mindfulness and emotional intelligence. And I say to them, none of you guys got arrested because you had crazy thoughts. We all have crazy thoughts. I have irrational thoughts all the time. Somebody will be going too slow in front of me and I want to hit them with my car. I have those thoughts less frequently now too, but the issue is we have a thought and we act on the thought. There's no space there. So getting back to why meditation is so important. There's no awareness, there's no space. And so um, I talk to them about being more mindful and developing and cultivating a, a meditation practice and it's pretty interesting. In the beginning of doing this, I started it about four or five years ago. I thought the entrepreneurship part would be the most important. It's actually the mindfulness part. That really, at the end of the program, they'll say, hey man, I'm meditating every day. It's awesome. It really amazes me. I'm gonna get back to a little um, mindfulness technique that I teach them at the end. So I could just get through smash here. So um, S is service, really important to me. What I find is that helping other people does several important things. One, it helped me change the mindset of poor me to lucky me. And I, I really believe that today. I have an amazing life. I'm incredibly blessed to have a healthy family, a lot of friends. I have all the resources to do whatever I want. That stuff doesn't really matter to me except for the fact that my kids are healthy. I have a great relationship with Professor Zucker and my wife. <laughs> I get to experience different things in life and travel and do all those things. Those things are what matter. And when I go into a prison, and I see people that haven't seen sunlight in six months or a year, and realize that most of them in there have an eighth or ninth grade education. So this starts around third grade. Prisons determine how many beds to build around fourth grade by how many people fail math. It's a really sad um, epidemic, but when I leave there, I realize how fortunate I am. I'm not thankful for trauma and tragedies, and we all have our own traumas and tragedies, but I no longer dwell on them, and helping other people really shuts off the voice in the head that's always chattering about, yeah, that happened, and screw this person, and, and focus on being present, being present with somebody else. The last part of it is H, um, and H stands for health. So 
there's a maxim, <clears throat> you should treat your body like a temple. When I was in your shoes, I'd treat my body like a trash can, which I don't recommend. But I did for a number of years. I treat my body and my mind like a, like a dumpster, whatever in it I want. Ultimately, um, that didn't work. And I've evolved my life around maybe four or so healthy habits that I do every day. One is sleep. I just take a lot of pride in when I was doing investment banking, I'd get up at 4 in the morning, send people emails that work for me, and be pissed when they, I'd get a response back by 5 or 5.30. <clears throat> and I was known as a guy that would work in the middle of the night, and I thought that was so cool. It's not cool. Right? Like Sleep is so important. People that say they don't need a lot of sleep is not true. I've heard sleep scientists invalidate that theory. We all need seven plus hours, some need eight or nine. But people that say they need four or five is just not true. So I, I'm very um, focused on sleep. I get up and go to sleep at the same time every day to make sure I have a routine. Um, exercise, exercise every single day. Important part of what I do, eat well. So I'm primarily plant-based. I love sweet food, I love cookies. There's a place in time for me towards the end of the day and it's just about balance. And the last thing is, I'd say negativity, avoiding negativity. There's a lot of negativity in the world. Um, there's a great quote that I think Jim Rome said, we're the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So I cut out negative people in my life. I have no time for people that complain, criticize, judge. That's great, um, not for me. So when I, it's funny to me when I'm out in restaurants or I'm traveling and you sit next to somebody, all you will hear is somebody complain, this person did this, that person's an asshole, this is terrible, my boss, it's all negativity. And I believe the universe is a magnet. Whatever I put out there, I'm magnetizing back into my life. I don't want any of that back in my life, so I don't do social media at all. You know, people have different opinions about that. But for me, I see kind of an Instagram profile of the person that has more than I have, and it's never enough for me. <coughs> there's, a, there's another quote that I love, comparison is the great thief of joy. I don't need to compare my life to somebody else. I have an amazing life until I see somebody else's life who seems more amazing than my life. And then all of a sudden I'm annoyed. So I don't do social media, don't watch news, read a couple of business headlines every day that are relevant to what I do, and that's how I keep my, my um, check on negativity affecting me. So I'll, I'll end with this, because I want to make sure we have some time for Q&A. What I've found is that um, a plan is super helpful for me, the way I live my life. Architects don't start building homes without a blueprint. Except, I don't know, maybe in Miami, I've seen some strange things. <laughs> did a remodel about five years ago, and I think they missed that in school. But <laughs> most architects don't start building a house without a blueprint. And I realized for many years, for 30 something years, I was walking around without a blueprint, without a plan, without an operating system. So, Smash is incredibly helpful in terms of creating the routines, the habits. Um, so, I'd say, in terms of advice, the first question to ask yourself is what do you want? Like, what kind of life do you want? What kind of house do you want to build? And I think the obvious instinctive answer is, well, I want to be happy, right? I want, but what I've found is that we have an extraordinary capacity for self-deception. The things we think are happiness are really more like fleeting pleasure. So I've become a lot more in tune to what's a fleeting pleasure, what's a long-term happiness, and satisfaction, and deep contentment. And <coughs> doing the work it takes to get those things because the other thing I figured out is there's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts to get that sense of equanimity that Scott has. I'm sure you see observing him and John Cabot's in and Sharon Salzberg. There's a great metaphor of boats that are on top of the water that it's windy out, the boats are going like this, but if you go down 20 feet, the water's calm. And that's where I try to live, below the surface where the water's calm no matter what's going on in the surface. So I'd say the real advice is, are you willing to do the work? I forget like, you want to be happy, whatever else your objective is, are you willing to do the work? And so I would say, be really intentional. You're the architect of your own lives, go build the life you want. Be intentional about your daily habits. First you make your habits, and your habits make you. Right, so be careful about what you do every day, create your blueprint, use smash, use some of it, use none of it. But create your operating system, your operating principles, your values, your routines. I found that success in life, success in business, success in life, success in relationships, 
It's all about creating a formula that works. Repeat it. Rinse the platter, repeat. So that sounds really, really boring, but it's the price for an amazing life. So it's discipline, it's self-awareness, it's focused effort. You do those three things with a plan, you're gonna get whatever you want. And if that's to be a billionaire, then you'll get that. If you wanna have great work-life balance, then you'll get that. But without it, you're gonna do what I did for a number of years, which is basically a pinball kind of bouncing around life and being pissed off when things aren't going your way. So I hope that's really helpful. I want to end with doing something that I teach in prison on the mindfulness side. It's called the box breath. Has anybody ever heard of that? No. So it's really interesting because um, there's various types of meditation. I tend to do what's called vipassana, just pay attention to breathing and awareness and kind of what's going in and out of my mind and imagine clouds floating in my conscious system now. Um, there's techniques different breathing techniques that can actually make you feel more relaxed very quickly. The breath is an amazing thing. And this is a technique that I found a number of years ago that if I'm really agitated or if I'm nervous about doing something, I'll do it for two or three minutes because it can instantly change your state. And the way it works is, and I'll ask you, we'll practice it for a minute or two. It's called the box breath because there's four breaths that go four different times. You breathe in through your nose for a count of four. So you hold for four seconds, and you breathe out for four seconds, and then you hold that for four seconds without breathing. So it's a box, four, 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 four. If you do that before a test, before something that's making you nervous, if you're upset about something, you'll be amazed what it actually does. It will actually hijack your thinking mind and go deeper into your subconscious, to your parasympathetic nerve system, and change how you're feeling. So why don't we just do that for two minutes and then I'll shut up. Talk too much. You just start by taking one deep breath in and out. Now we'll just do a couple of cycles where you breathe in through your nose for a count of four. Two, three, four. Hold it for four. Two, three, four. And breathe out for a count of four. And hold that, three, four. And breathe in through your nose for four. Now. And in through four. So, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Questions? Okay. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your story. That was very helpful in many ways. Um, my question is for that age range of 20 something in terms of clients who might have experienced a lot of trauma um, or someone that I'm mentoring or some, some, a, a child who's experienced trauma and now growing into adulthood, <coughs> what advice would you have for me, I guess, in terms of someone trying to help guide a young adult into owning their story in the way that you did? Because although it seemed very effortless to us, it took a lot of work to get there, I'm sure, to own your story in such a way, and um, that would just be very helpful advice in terms of not pushing too hard for someone to, to help someone own their story. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely not effortless, I assure you that. Right. There's a lot of um, deep introspective work, professionals that know what they're doing, and I think it's a matter of just getting underneath the story. It requires a lot of honesty that 
certainly I didn't have for a number of years. So I would encourage to deal, talk with somebody that, that has a lot of expertise in this and getting beneath the layer of the surface resentments, the surface anger, because those are usually the manifestations of deeper trauma <clears throat> to try to uncover kind of the real nuggets and talk about it. Talking about it for me with people that understand it and will listen has been incredibly helpful. But without the willingness of the person to go there, um, it's hard to make progress. I think it's really just cultivating the willingness to understand the deep roots and then talking to somebody that has some expertise that's willing to spend the time or, or delve in to really get to the bottom of it. How would you go about uh, cutting out negativity when it's someone like a family member or maybe a close friend that you can't really just cut off? Maybe they haven't always been like that, but recently they're just extremely negative. How would you go about that, um, dealing with that, since you can't really cut them out completely? Um, well, look, you may or may not be able to cut them out, and I'm not here to give you advice on that. I can tell you that I haven't talked to some people for a long time because I value my serenity and peace more than I do talking to that particular person. Let's just say you don't want to go there. I would say be really mindful about your interactions with them and be prepared for their negativity and to um, be aware that that might be how they are, but you're not going to let it penetrate into your world and, and to not engage. Not engaging from the you like not feeding the, what I call the thought monster, not feeding it with like, oh yeah, I agree with you. Oh, that person is an that, that just creates the avalanche that draws more people in. Okay. Thank you. Um, but yeah, again, thank you for coming. Really, really powerful story. Um, in terms of, I think one of the themes I picked up was like, you know, pick yourself up from the bootstrap type of mentality, uh, especially given the circumstances you talked about. So what, what about, I guess, you as like an individual, you know, pertinent traits uh, allowed you to, you know, to, besides basketball, to really succeed and you know, make your way to BU and then on to law school? as opposed to any other individual, you know, who's uh, getting, you know, government uh, assistance. That, that, that doesn't have a similar story to you. Yeah. I think it's a combination of things. And, and I used to be really proud to say I was this self-made guy. I was the first person in my family to go to college, to be professional, to make money, to do all that stuff. And I never will use that word again because it's horseshit. The idea of being self-made is ridiculous, right? Nobody is self you Just technically, you can't be self-made. And further, there was a lot of people that influenced me. My mom was an amazing person. Um, my stepfather, despite some of his shortcomings, emphasized education and achievement. I had some teachers along the way. Most of the time, I sort of ignored school, but I did have some teachers that impacted me. So I'd say it was a combination of certain people. I'd say it's a combination of luck. It's another thing I've learned in life. People that hit home runs in business think they're the smartest guys in the world. If you've done it once or twice, you might have just been lucky. So I don't discount the force of luck. And I would also say um, insecurity. Like, so I was, I wanted people to think I was the smartest guy, the most successful guy, and insecurity will drive you, it will drive you places, and there's a lot of um, insecure, egomaniac, successful people. It helped. A lot of these defective traits can be helpful to a certain point. So I was, really focused on making people think a certain thing than I did until I realized it didn't matter to me. So I said it's a combination of things. I couldn't point my finger to one. I'd say actually one other thing that was really important. When I was younger, I went to a summer camp in upstate New York. I met kids there who were from Long Island and lived a different way than I did. And a couple of times during the year, I'd go to their homes and I would see these nice houses and parents were doctors and none of my, I didn't know a, a family friend that was a doctor or a lawyer or that wasn't how I grew up. I had two nice cars and nice grass. I was like, you know, how do you do that? And so that influenced my thinking also. It's, it's a combination of stuff. And nobody really knows the all the we have so much so many inputs, the media and our childhoods and people we encounter, all the things that go on to influence our thinking. At the end of the day, I think I've just I was fortunate 
um, even though there was a lot of pain and suffering along the way. Once I figured that part out, I was just fortunate to have a confluence of events that enabled me to not wind up like Bobby. Do you have just one book that you would recommend to our class that you found to be instrumental in you being here and telling your story today? I would say Search Inside Yourself is one of my favorite books because it's really practical. And of course anything Scott wrote. <laughs> Untethered Soul is one of my favorite books. Um, Michael Singer, who wrote that book, also wrote I think called The Surrender Experiment. And he's achieved, I think, you might even, do you know him? Okay, no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just a phenomenal writer, and he's achieved a lot in business. And I didn't know that until I read his second book, because Untethered Soul to me is one of the most beautiful books ever written. But Search Inside Yourself is was written by a guy who was an early engineer at Google and developed this program teaching it. It's very practical. It's very practical about acceptance and outcome detachment. It's taking Buddhism and turning it into practical reality. And we were talking about attachment when I first got here. That's another huge thing I've learned. I can work really hard, I can strive, I can be persistent, determine all those things. At a certain point, I have to learn to let go of the outcome I want because that drives a lot of suffering. Yeah, and just if I may, so you all did have a reading from the Untethered Soul mm -hmm. early in the class, and you can follow up on that because the book is next to the book. And you all had a reading, the book is potential over the monitor reading from a couple of weeks ago, which is from Search Inside Yourself. Um, so you have a taste of both of those, and they have a great deal to offer beyond the taste that you have. So uh, going beyond yourself and thinking about those uh, who you love, how do you convey the importance of what you're doing through Smash onto them without having them, you know, go through your life experiences? Because for instance, uh, your daughters have had a, a much uh, more coddled life. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't want to say. So, how do you how do you keep your family and yourself grounded um, despite living in this bubble that I think yeah. we all do? Um, yeah, it's a great question because um, my kids are growing up a life that is so materially different than how I did. It's not even one or two levels different. It's like a different world, different. Early on, I was so enthusiastic about meditation and Buddhism, which makes the most sense to me. <clears throat> I would talk to my wife and kids and friends and I was trying to convert everybody to Buddhist, which gets kind of irritating for other people. Now it's basically, um, it's by action. Right? Like people are like, hey, how do you do all the things you do? You run this company and you seem like really successful, but you're always pretty calm, and you're working out sometimes at 11 o'clock in the morning doing yoga. I see you, what, what's going on? Like, if you want what I have, do what I do. If you don't want what I have, then do whatever you want to do. And so, whoever wants to listen to what I do, I'm happy to share it. I've got no proprietary monopoly on Smash or, or any of the practices. And by the way, they're not novel, right? Meditation's been around, Buddhism has been around, like these things have been around for a long time. It's just about a disciplined approach to it, doing it every day. So what I do is my kids see me do it. There's a time in the day where I'm meditating, they know they can't bother daddy during meditation time. Like that's the only time they can't bother me. Um, they see me do service work, and we take them to do it at a young age. They see how I interact with other people. I go, I will always take people's calls to help. If somebody needs real help, if somebody needs advice, I'm kind of an informal mentor to a bunch of people. They just see it and it'll seep in, and, and that took me a while to figure out because I wanted to just impose it, and I don't, it didn't work. My kids still don't meditate. Um, they think it's interesting. They think it's funny that I do it a lot, but ultimately, for me, it's, it's just about showing people, showing my kids, showing my family, the world that um, I want to occupy and how I approach it, and then getting them engaged. So I, we do, the one thing we do make them do is go to um, community service at a young age because it's important for me for them to understand that the way we live in our little bubble is not how most people live. So they know about my prison program, they help sometimes, they'll print out a certificate for somebody, just getting them involved.
few minutes left. Deb will come in so we can all take a picture together. You know, <laughs> <laughs> mindfulness is about awareness. Awareness of your surroundings. Um, so if you want to stand, we'll take a pic. We'll take a picture. Deb is here. We'll take a picture. Um, that's, a, that's a Martin landing. Sorry, my last name is Martin. It's Martian. <laughs> um, but in the few moments we have, and Steve will stay late after for about five or so minutes, five or seven minutes. If anyone wants to ask questions, you know, out afterward. Um, in the, any questions that sort of connect up our class? First of all, let me say, I, I, I'm so blown away by what you shared. The, 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 he touched on everything, right? He touched on everything we've explored. And I, and I use the word, I think, very hesitant, so I, 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 this is semester. You just, it was quite beautiful, it was quite powerful, it was quite, Tearful for me. The way, the way you talk about um, the way you talk not just about your early childhood experiences, but, but the prison project and what you realized as a motivating factor along that. This was this is what it's all this is what it's all about, to wake up out of and into. So we've been practicing mindfulness, we've been practicing meditation, we've been talking about it, you know, as, as, as we talk about the deeper layers of it, right? What it, what, what it might, to be mindfully aware, to be engaged, to be connected to that. So I, I have one question for you, which I'll, I'll just sort of say for the end, just uh, uh, any questions that connect up to your next several weeks of this semester? You're writing papers on um, mindfulness, connecting to something that matters to you personally. And, um, and then you have this life. So let's take a moment, and if there's one question that emerges that's really pertinent, don't miss, you know, success leaves clues. So my paper is actually on like balancing all the responsibilities we have as lawyers, as people, just in general. And I know you spoke about A is for autonomy and how important it is. So how do you handle, because I'm a planner, I love to plan things, but I have a really hard time when things don't go according to plan. So, you know, when you, you do try to be as disciplined as you can with your schedule, if, you know, a wrench is thrown in, how do you handle that without getting overwhelmed that everything else might get messed up? Yeah, so, so it's hard early in your career. Right? I'm not going to pretend like going into your first law job, walk into your boss, like, listen, I've got my own rules here. <laughs> don't get it to work until 10, no calls after 6. <laughs> That's not going to work. <coughs> I think it's a matter of creating boundaries for yourself and creating rules and systems with the awareness that you're walking into a challenging environment as a first year lawyer. And that might mean meditating early in the day if that's important to you, or exercising before you go to work, or doing the things that you know are important for your peace and serenity. Because if you don't get to them because something came up that you didn't plan at 7 o'clock and you have to stay in the office until 10, then you're going to be really resentful and spiteful. So I think it's just managing the things that you can control that are important to um, your daily routine so that you get them done. But you know, the reality is this, this class is so important because you're going into a field that's challenging. You're called the adversary because you get to fight with other people. Every client has a lawyer who has... Um, a mouthpiece that, that wants certain things and it's conflict oriented and it's stressful and it's a lot of work and I think it's super important to create the program that works for you and the awareness that you're going to be in a challenging and frustrating situation but if you do the self-help things, if you do self-love and, and all the stuff that is going to make you feel better, um, I think the first few years are going to be a lot a lot better, especially if you go into it with this awareness, which is why this class is so important, right? You, people will graduate, they go into the world, and the legal profession is nothing like this. It's really cutthroat and difficult, and hopefully you get to good firms with good people. But the fact that you've cultivated some awareness is amazing. I would just say focus on the two or three or four things you need to get done every day for yourself and make sure you get them done in a way that whatever happens throughout your busy schedule, it doesn't impact. I just had a quick question. So, one of the most important things that I've taken from this class is what you like to call the yellow light. 
trying to create a wedge of awareness between stimulus and response. So what I'm trying to get from this class is to be more thoughtful and aware once I have a stimulus so I can determine the response and I can choose the appropriate response. How have you widened that gap of awareness or how have you lengthened that yellow light for you to create and pick the best response possible? Is that a direct result of you engaging in meditation or is it the smash? Is it all of those things? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because I think it's hard to quantify and as an analytical guy, I like quantification. Um, what I found is the more I meditate, the more that space increases and the more I practice reading Buddhist related materials, watching these Buddhist <coughs> videos, hanging around with people that are on the same journey that talk about the same kind of things. It's just, it's like watching paint dry. You don't know exactly when it's drying, but it dries at some point. It just gets bigger. And I'll tell you a quick story about um, how I, you don't really see how meditation works until you need it. It's one of those things. It's like being a soldier and you train. You don't really know about your training until it kicks in. We were skiing a couple weeks ago. My daughter got her, she was on another mountain, and we got a call that we needed to race over there. And a very strange thing happened. I was incredibly calm. And it, it wasn't like, Steve, be calm, be strong. It was, I just was calm. And I was surprised afterwards how calm I was. And it was because there was nothing I could do about it. I was on a chairlift going up a mountain. I had to get down to the mountain. I had to get to a different mountain. What was I going to do? And so you can't intellectualize that, which I try to do for a number of years. You just got to learn what were you to develop that through cultivation. So I would say practice every day, and you will be surprised. Um, I tell friends about it and say don't do 20 minutes on Saturday and then forget about it for two weeks and then two Sundays from now do an hour and some yoga class. I go, Just do five minutes every day, every day for a month. Then do six minutes, then do seven minutes. And then make it part of your daily routine and then things will pop up in your life and you will notice stimuli that used to drive you nuts and you didn't react the way you used to react and you'll be like, oh, it's working. <laughs> I think you mentioned you, you wrote a book. Uh, what was the name of the book? The book is called Rain Power. It's about developing skills to be a rainmaker. And again, it's the same philosophy uh, <coughs> that I talked about today. It's creating a formula that works. And that's one that went very much geared towards professional achievement, which I think is interesting, but not as interesting to me anymore. I have a copy in my office if you're interested. But I think that this is interesting. The, this is sort of this evolution of you, right? The life yeah. journey. You mentioned Mark, the life journey, right? The life journey. So Smash has evolved in many ways out of you. It seems like making sense of life as it went, finding and picking and choosing. When you have this idea of the blueprint, which I think is brilliant, it really, I mean, do you know, do you have a plan, right? It's, it's for yourself. We have plans when we litigate something or we're going to do something for somebody else. Do we have it for ourselves? So in some ways to, to Cassidy's question as well. So each of those is very powerful unto itself. Together, it seems to be this. Could you say anything about like a little bit of everything for sure, and maybe some of the pieces that seem to be more readily available in your life? Like if you say, do this blueprint, and I don't mean to be too analytical, but I do think, should we keep service on our mind and do a little something, even if it's giving somebody a dollar because that's what we want to do to be of service? Is it, is it having a little bit of each at least and then building up and then maybe some, maybe meditation is big or meditation is small? That's question one, if, there's, if that makes sense to you. And question two is, so does this journey continue for you? Is, is if, if you were to stop Smash tomorrow, do you think that you would begin to change? Yeah, I just got the anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll answer the second question first. I was in a dark place, and I have no intention returning to the hell from which I barely escaped. So the idea of stopping Smash for me, because I do have the mindset of optimizing, like what lever can I push? I was super lazy in high school, college, and law school, despite graduating with honors, because I, I would figure out what would work and just do that and then do nothing else. <laughs> now, Cheryl, who some of you might have had as a teacher, was the exact opposite. She was more of a topical class, did all the work, and 
like, bye, I'm going out with my friends, have fun. <clears throat> I don't live my life like that anymore because I don't want to try to optimize and pull the right levers for fear of returning to that mindset that I used to be in. So I don't know what would happen, but I'm not going to find out. <laughs> the first part of it, I would say I love the metaphor when you're on a plane and they give the announcement that if the cabin pressure or if you lose cabin pressure, put the oxygen mask on first. So it's put it on yourself first. So service is very important. Um, but for me, it's the daily things that I do that make sure I'm living a healthy, grounded lifestyle. So it's sleeping, eating, exercise, avoiding negativity, not putting anything that's bad for me in my body, um, meditating. I've been this day of meditation in many years because, again, that's one of those things I'm scared. I, I, I'm the kind of person, I'm a slippery slope kind of guy. If I could figure out, I could, eh, a little bit less effort over here, still got the same result. Oh, great, maybe a little less effort over here. I, I don't want to do that because I have an amazing life. So I don't miss meditation. So I, if you're asking me what are the things, I'd say those things, meditate. Um, for me, it's, it's so ingrained in my life. It's also keeping those spiritual principles top of mind. I, I, I'm an entrepreneur, we're in a world where we're Continue on, but say what these are, because I thought you, you listened maybe five or seven or so. Yeah. Like you could continue on. So I, I remember when it was KLC. G H H. Everything for me is an acronym, by the way. <laughs> Kindness, love, and passion, blend. I know. <laughs> Some are better than others. <laughs> Kindness, love, compassion, gratitude, honesty, and humility. So I'd say. Living in a space of gratitude is really important, and honesty. I mentioned this before, we have the amazing capacity to deceive ourselves. So just meditation is very helpful in determining whether that voice in our head is telling us the truth or not. <coughs> um, shall we take a picture? Sure. Take a picture. All right. Thank you.